Hello, everybody. Really nice to meet you. Uh, I hope you're not starving yet. Uh, I'll try to speed up a bit. Um, yes, welcome everyone to OWASP and to my talk about securing web apps with modern uh, platform security features. Uh, today's talk will be about uh, a couple new features in the web platform that you can actually use to protect your applications and users from common web vulnerabilities. And uh, my name is Lukas Weichselbaum. I'm an information security engineer at Google. Uh, I work in the Zurich office, and my team is focusing on improving product security by targeting proactive projects with um, the aim of mitigating whole classes of bugs. And um, today, I will split the talk in two sections. Uh, first, a very quick uh, run through common web security flaws, uh, not like explaining what they are, but more like uh, uh, looking at VRP data and seeing which ones are common and try to categorize them and map them to web platform security features. And um, in the second part, we'll talk about these web platform security features that are, some of them are super new actually. Uh, we probably not even have heard about them yet, uh, but it would be super cool to start a discussion about them maybe later outside as well. So uh, let's start with the security flaws. Uh, Google has a VRP program. Uh, I think for over eight years now, and it's not only a great source for you know finding bugs and fixing them, but it also allows us to actually look at the root causes and uh, identify new classes of bugs and kind of try to get a feeling of trends within these bug classes, right? So there's uh, thousands of bugs submitted every year, and uh, in particular, the web application bugs are out of interest uh, for us. If you look at the left side of the chart, you'll see that less than the half is uh, non-web bugs, like you know, server-side misconfiguration or Android applications. We'll not focus about these today. We'll focus on the right side of the chart, which is slightly more than 50%, and these are web endemic bugs, right? Um, so, um, of course, Cross-site scripting is a big offender in this space, right? And it's still around. Um, and then there's other things like cross-site uh, request forgery, click checking, and other uh, web bugs, which we'll cover in a little bit more detail in the later sections. Um, so the first big category is, of course, injection bugs, right? And I'm not going into detail about what cross-site scripting is, because I assume most of you know. Um, the only thing I want to mention is uh, the second type of cross-site scripting, like DOM-based XSS, is actually becoming more relevant these days because more and more code is moving from the server side to the client side, and it's actually quite easy for developers to introduce DOM-based XSS by accident, and it's, on the other hand, very hard for security reviewers to spot these bugs in code reviews, right? So that's uh, cross-site scripting, and uh, part of the talk will be about to prevent and mitigate these bugs. Uh, but the larger part of the talk will be about uh, insufficient isolation and new web platform features that help you to address this category. Um, so the classical example here is cross-site request forgery, right? And I'm not going into the detail how that works, but the very important uh, feature of it is that the server has not enough information to actually tell apart a request from uh, your, like the site's or, uh, origin compared to a request that originates from um, a evil.com site, right? Like from a random origin on the internet. So evil.com can put the form that looks exactly the same on their site and have JavaScript submit that form. And for the server, uh, since the browser will append cookies to both requests, these two requests look exactly the same, right? And one of the web platform mechanisms we want to present today is exactly about this. So, and uh, cross-site request forgery is just one of these uh, isolation-related issues. Um, there's also uh, cross-site leaks, uh, timing attacks, and lately also a couple of new classes of vulnerabilities that are, have popped up that also fall into this category of insufficient isolation in the browser platform. Um, the most uh, known new one is probably uh, Spectre, which is a microarchitectural issue. Um, and yes, so 
you could say like this chart looks great, but it's maybe a bit Google biased. And you're right, it's the data from our VRP, so it's a, it has a Google bias. But if you look at um, other uh, VRP data, for example, from Hackathon, uh, you will see that they actually see uh, similar trends uh, when it comes to cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery, et cetera, et cetera, right? So this is still a, a big issue for the industry. And also our friends at Mozilla report similar statistics about these vulnerabilities. So uh, what we want to do now is to address these classes of bugs uh, on the, in the web platform, in the browser, right? And uh, there's a couple of new things uh, that have been already launched and are coming up soon, uh, which I want to show you today. And as I mentioned, uh, we basically have divided this up into two categories, uh, isolation uh, mechanisms, and injection defenses in the browser. And in this talk at OVASP, I'll mostly focus on the isolation part, uh, mostly because of timing reasons, uh, but if you want to see the full-fledged talk, you can also uh, get the recording from Google I.O. Um, and so, let's start with isolation. So, you might ask, why do we need isolation? Uh, and the answer to that is that because of certain issues in the way the browsers isolate different origins from each other, uh, there is vulnerabilities like cross-site request forgery, cross-site script inclusion, uh, click checking, web timing attacks, Spectre, they all fall into that category. And in particular, into this subcategory uh, of attacks on resources. So attacks on resources are usually caused by the fact that any site on the internet can load a resource from your server and your server cannot tell apart that resource load from a resource load originating from your own site, right? Um, so there's attacks on resources and a second subcategory uh, of uh, isolation related attacks are attacks on Windows, more specifically on uh, attacks based on like having a reference to a window of a different origin. So the web is very open when it comes to that regard. Any site on the internet can open a new window and navigate that window to your document, right, or to your domain. And that per se is fine, but by doing so, that site will still have a reference, a window reference to your uh, window. And because of that window reference, you can do a couple of things that are may or may not be surprising to you, right? For example, you can uh, count frames uh, in your site. Uh, the original window can uh, also do some other, you know, site channel attacks, uh, often used in cross-site search. The new cross-site search uh, attacks, they can do like uh, tab nabbing, uh, et cetera. And especially for browsers like uh, Firefox that don't have a full site isolation implemented yet, uh, it also means that they cannot put the new window document in a separate process and protect you from Spectre because of this window reference. So the second platform mechanism I'll show uh, in a bit will be uh, about that particular feature. Uh, but before we get into that, a super quick uh, review on origins and sites. I assume most of you know what uh, same origin means, but maybe not everyone knows about the concept of same site. So same origin is basically the tuple of uh, scheme, host, and port. And whenever two URLs uh, have the same values in this tuple, they're considered same origin. For example, www.google.com slash foo is same origin to www.google.com slash bar. Um, same site is similar but different in the sense that um, neighboring subdomains uh, on the same registrable, reg registrable domain would be considered same site. So mail.google.com and photos.google.com would be considered same site, but not same origin. Um, and basically everything else is just cross-site. And this distinction is very important because based on that, the browser enforces uh, different isolation mechanisms on your site, right? And with that, we come to the first uh, new web platform feature to address uh, the resource isolation problem we showed you on the 
uh, first slide. And it's actually quite simple. It is just uh, three new request headers set by the browser uh, that basically give the server a chance to, our, to reason about the context and the source of an HTTP request. So implementation-wise, it's really simple. It's just uh, three request headers. Uh, the first one is sec fetch site. This is sent by the browser for every request and it basically just indicates the source of a request, right? It just tells the server, this request was made like cross-site or for example, this request came from your own site from the same origin. Um, and that is extremely helpful for the server because suddenly in the cross-site request filtering case, uh, the server can actually reason and say, oh wow, this request came from evil.com and not from my site.com. Uh, so I may just want to block it or strip cookies or do whatever with it, right? Uh, you can have custom logic on the server dealing with that information. Uh, the second uh, header is secfetch mode, indicating the type of the request. Um, and most simply put, this means uh, this header indicates if this was like a resource load or if it was a navigation. Um, and we'll see in a second that this information is also quite handy uh, to protect uh, the server side against a couple of uh, web vulnerabilities. And the last header is uh, SecFetch user, which basically informs the server if the navigation was caused as a direct consequence of a user interaction, like a click or a key press, or if it was, uh, you know, JavaScript based or something else. So uh, let's look at a super simple example for this. Um, on the top, you see a same origin uh, resource load. Uh, Site.example loads a file from uh, Site.example server. And by that, the browser sends an additional request header uh, called secfetch site with the value same origin because it's a same origin request. And the, deser the server can say, well, same origin requests are allowed. That's perfectly fine. Uh, the example below is actually a cross-site request. Evil.com requests something from site.example. And by doing so, the user's browser will basically indicate uh, on the request that this request was made uh, cross-site. Because the host and uh, of the request and uh, the actual source uh, don't match. So that's still very simple and simple information, but you can actually use these building blocks to build some quite powerful server-side logic to protect uh, web applications against a couple of common web application security flaws. And um, that example here is a little bit simplified, but uh, this basically prevents a couple of resource uh, isolation-related issues um, and most commonly known, like it will prevent uh, cross-site request forgery, uh, cross-site script inclusion, uh, click checking, and similar issues, right? Um, the logic is actually easy. Uh, the first condition just checks if the sec fetch header, request header is available, because if not, uh, it's a browser that does not support this and will just allow the request because we don't want to break the site for you know, users on all the browsers, for example. Um, but eventually, when all the browsers will support the feature, this, like, the security will also be uh, available to, to more users. Um, the second condition is basically there to ensure that all same site or same origin requests are allowed to proceed, right? So if your site makes a request for JavaScript or uh, navigation or whatever, right, the server will just normally respond to it um, because it's the same origin or same site navigation. And the third one basically ensures that cross-site navigation, top-level navigation, is also allowed. If you don't have the third condition, your site will basically be siloed in the internet and no one can, will be able to link to your site, right? Uh, there's some use cases for that as well, but in the normal case, you still want other places to be able to link to your site. So you still would allow 
top-level navigation, even if it happens uh, cross-origin. Um, so everything else is blocked. What that means, for example, if you had take the XSSI example, um, if evil.com loads a JavaScript from your site and the browser sends cookies with that request, right? Um, your server will basically block that request because it's a cross-origin resource load and you did not explicitly allow this uh, here. So uh, there's actually many, many more things you can do with fetch metadata, but this is like a, a trivial example how to address resource uh, as, like resource isolation related issues uh, with that mechanism. Usually you would roll out uh, a fetch metadata based protection uh, in the form of a middleware on the server side. Um, you would start monitoring uh, blocked requests, not actually blocking them, and review all the requests that actually got blocked, right? Because potentially your application has endpoints that are meant for cross-origin communication. For example, if you have a course endpoint, uh, that is meant for cross-origin uh, communication and you would probably want to whitelist that endpoint from that logic to still allow that, right? And if, you've done, if, you've, if you have done that, you would uh, switch to enforcement mode and actually, you know, for example, block all requests that don't fulfill this uh, criteria. Or you can also do something custom like, you know, stripping cookies, redirecting to the, you know, entry site, or doing other things, right? And um, also, uh, very important to note here, you would also have to set a very header for SecFetch site and SecFetch mode. And uh, this also has a very nice side effect that browsers will basically be forced to have a per origin cache uh, compared to having a cache for all sites, right? And implicitly by that, you will uh, prevent a couple of access search related issues just by ensuring that the stuff is not cached across origins. And uh, so, uh, fetch metadata is shipping in Chrome in the next version, in uh, 76, but uh, you can already play with it uh, by enabling the experimental web platform features flag. Um, and yes, there's also already two projects on GitHub that uh, provide a proof of concept implementation for a resource uh, isolation based um, middleware using fetch metadata. Uh, give it a try, give us feedback, and i um, super curious to hear, hear what you think about the approach. And with that, I'm switching to the next feature new feature, which is a cross-origin opener policy. And that in particular addresses the isolation issues related to window references, the second category uh, we had uh, on the slides before. So what is this about? Uh, as we already said at the beginning, uh, any site on the internet can open your site in a new window and have a reference to that window. And with that reference, they can, you know, they can send post messages they can count frames, they maybe leverage other uh, site channels to you know, learn about something about your site. For example, they could find out if the user is logged in or not based on some things. Um, and they can also navigate your site away to an arbitrary uh, other site. And there's a very easy way to prevent that, and that's uh, the cross-origin opener policy response header. Um, you basically set, can set this header to same origin or same site, and by that, any cross-site uh, page that opens your window will still be able to open the window, right? But it will not have the reference anymore, and by that, it will not be able to navigate your uh, window uh, and your site anymore. And um, especially nice, the, the same site value, uh, can be used if you, for example, have a couple of subdomains and they, you know, communicate through post message and you would still want to allow that, right? So, this response header is uh, quite new. It's already implemented in Firefox nightly, so you can try it. Uh, Chrome is working on it, but uh, as of now, I think there is uh, nothing implemented yet, but we'll hope it will come soon. And um, another very nice side effect of setting this response header is that browsers like Firefox 
who don't have full site isolation to protect against spectre uh, will be able to put uh, the open window or you know the other domain in a different um, browsing context group, which means uh, the browser will be able to separate uh, the domains, the origins in with different processes, right? And by that, uh, protecting uh, against spectre-like attacks. So, uh, especially for Firefox users, this header would be quite interesting as well, because I think it will take uh, some more time for Firefox to actually natively implement uh, full site isolation. Um, yes, and with that, uh, I will do a couple more slides on injection defenses. Um, there is a CSP, which you can use to protect against stored and reflected XSS, and partially DOM-based XSS. Um, it's, uh, it was a long, long ride for CSP. Uh, I don't know, I guess some of you have seen CSP and worked with CSP before, and you have seen policies like that. Um, it's, it's not great. Uh, these type of policies are super bad because they are trivially bypassable, they are incredibly hard to maintain without breaking things, and yeah, they're just not really worth your time, right? Uh, what we re would suggest instead is using uh, a CSP based on nonces because it has uh, two critical advanta advantages. And the first is that this policy does not need configuration or per endpoint or per site. Uh, as a matter of fact, we use the, almost the same policy across all Google applications. And the second thing is it's not uh, susceptible to um, the whitelist-based CSP bypasses, uh, which uh, the previous policy, the whitelist-based policy would be. Um, so, we actually use this type of policy on over 60% of uh, all outgoing uh, Google text HTML traffic, and I think on over 100 domains, and it was quite effective. Uh, just uh, in the last 12 months, it actually blocked 20 high-risk XSS bugs, and for us, that's very valuable time to actually fix the bugs and uh, preventing them from being exploited. So, I'm not going into the details how to roll out the CSP based on nonces, but there is a, a nice write-up on csp.withgoogle.com that gives you a step-by-step -step, uh, guide on how to do that. And I also strongly recommend if you already have a CSP or if you diverge from the template to actually use the CSP evaluator because it actually is very useful to spot common bypasses in a policy that make it completely bypassable. Um, so whenever you have a red exclamation mark in your policy, you might want to do something about it or just delete the policy. And yeah, the TLDR is, the nice thing is, it's like always the same, uh, except of the nonce which has to change on every response. Um, it's definitely better than whitelist-based CSP, and uh, it's a good mitigation against stored and reflected XSS. And with the new CSP free strict dynamic keyword, you actually can use the nonce-based CSP even in the case uh, when you'll have third-party JavaScript code that loads uh, resources, right? like payment integration, host uh, using JavaScript from CDNs or uh, widgets, right? In that case, earlier you couldn't use a nonce-only CSP, but with strict dynamic you can also now uh, use a nonce-based CSP in these cases. And here is a small pitch for another talk. Uh, there's also trusted types uh, coming up in the web platform, and it's an amazing new feature, especially extremely well suited for preventing it against DOM-based XSS. And uh, there's a talk by Christoph Kotovic and Mike Samuel, uh, I think after the lunch break. And uh, of course, I don't want to steal their thunder, right? So you should. So, sorry? Hall C130. Hall C130. So you should totally check that out. Um, it's one of my favorite, favorite new web platform features. And um, what's really nice about it is it also plays very well with the classical CSP. So you can set a, a single policy with trusted types and nonces, and together they are very effective in actually preventing and mitigating the vast majority of XSS issues, right? So that should be your 2019 goal. Um, and yes, with that I will wrap up. And uh, Basically, you can now wake up again. I put everything on a single slide. You can take a photo and pretend you know everything about these features now. 
Um, the, the TLDR is that you can use CSP free for reflected and stored XSS, trusted types for DOM-based XSS, uh, fetch metadata request header to protect against isolation issues uh, that are based on resource loads, and you can use cross-origin opener policy to protect your window references from tampering. And with that, I wanted to thank you for being here today. Uh, the slides are online as well. Um, and I put some of the links uh, also here, just in case you were not able to note them down previously. And um, I will hang around a bit longer in case you have questions. And, sorry? Oh, we even have some time for questions, if there are some. So, yeah. Sure. So until the slide, until the slide that you have, um, that it's clickable and it was a GET request. Was uh, a, clickable, was it a fetch metadata? Yes. One second. In the beginning. So, was it uh, yeah, the... That, that slide, you just passed it. This one? Next one? Yeah. Yes. So, so the third condition, why does it have to be a get? What if it was um, supposed So this is mostly for cross-site request forgery protection. So a classical cross-site request forgery case is a post message, cross-origin. Um, and if you would, for example, allow a post here, you would still be able to protect it against XSSI and other issues, but uh, post-based cross-site request forgery would not be protected if you would allow post here. And you need get because otherwise your site would not be reachable from the internet anymore. So if you also prevent get, then any link from a cross-origin domain would not work because your server would reject it. What you could do is you can redirect to the main page uh, if you don't want to allow get as well, but that's already quite advanced. But there's use cases for that. So basically, we are only allowing uh, a get request clicked, but if it was a post request, we are blocking it? Yes, if it's a cross-origin post, that logic would block it. Okay. If you have a course endpoint or something that actually is expected to receive post requests cross-origin, you can have an additional whitelist to you know, allow this kind of request. Okay, thanks. Um, are you working with the W3C for things like fetch metadata to standardize the headers? Because if it's just in Chrome, you know, it's uh, difficult. Yes, so. of course. Uh, there is actually a W3C spec for fetch metadata. It just got moved from Mike West's GitHub repository to W3C. And I think uh, there's, like, there is consensus that it makes sense. Uh, Chrome already, just already has the prototype and uh, others will follow soon. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about the fetch metadata. Sure. Uh, I didn't really understand if uh, how does it improve the security because uh, in case an attacker wants to, uh, for example, send a GET request to some resource of another site, uh, I mean, he could maybe just, I mean, he could send an AJAX request where he controls the request headers and then he could change the fetch so it, metadata. It's a sec metadata is has the sec prefetch, prefetch uh, prefix, sorry. So you cannot set this header uh, through the JavaScript API. This is a protected header by the browser. Only the browser can send and set these headers. So which uh, every browser uh, implement this uh, enforcement that they're not allowed to set uh, sec headers? I, I think all browsers uh, disallow setting uh, certain headers, and that uh, the sec prefix. Prefix uh, is one that is, I think, protected in all browsers. I think there's also other headers, uh, request headers that you cannot set uh, in the JavaScript API Explicit. for security reasons. Oh. Sorry? Yeah. Sorry, can you repeat that? What you said? The referral header, you cannot set an arbitrary value there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And I think we're over time already, or no? Okay, but I'll still hang around and let uh, Felipe talk, so.